Good morning. We are following up. Uh oh. Hold on a second. Is that better? Okay. I think I'm the problem. <laughs> we are following up uh, after that glorious celebration last week, Resurrection Sunday. We're actually starting a new little series. It's going through the book of Acts for the most part, but we're really going to be looking at the life of Peter. When you think about the resurrection, and after all of the crowds have dispersed, knowing that the tomb is empty, and once Jesus has ascended, I wonder if the question of now what was going through the minds of those believers who were left behind. And we know that in Acts chapter 1, we see the last words that Jesus speaks to the apostles before he is ascended. He tells them, gives them some last minute instructions, and then he tells them, listen, before you start going crazy about what you're supposed to be doing, I need you to wait. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 he says, wait, because you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses. I wonder how hard it was for them to wait. I wonder how hard it was for Peter to wait, especially in light of what we know about Peter's life. If you've seen, how many of you have seen The Chosen? Any, like any season. I've seen all the seasons so far. And they really do an amazing job of, of characterizing Peter. It's appropriate to look at at least the first half of the book of Acts through the eyes and life of Peter because he is such a focal point uh, in the earthly ministry of Jesus in terms of God, his activity and some of the profound things that come forth, sometimes because of Peter's openness and sometimes because of Peter's extraness. So before we could talk about Peter and how the power of the gospel and the power of the resurrection transformed him, we need to think about who Peter was, what he was like before even the crucifixion. So we know that he's a natural-born leader. That's obvious. It was also a little bit impetuous. In John chapter 18, verse 10, it's Peter who takes out the sword and chops off the, the uh, soldier's ear. And Jesus has to heal the man's ear right there on the spot. Now, for Peter, he's a man of deep passion. That's just a part of who he is at that point. He's also a little, you know, braggadocious. Jesus, I, all these other people betray you, but I will never betray you. Not me. And yet, not long after that, when the cock crows three times, it's Peter who denies that he's even known Jesus. And he knows in that moment that he has betrayed his master. Those were some of the struggles that Peter had. Peter was a man of passion. Peter was the one who proclaimed, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter also had a big mouth. It would get him into trouble. To the extent when he chastises Jesus, when Jesus talks about why he has come and the fact that he has come, he is going to be crucified. Peter's like, may it not be so. And Jesus has to say, Get thee behind me, Satan. This is the same man who Jesus said, flesh and blood have not revealed the other statement to you. Now he's saying, get thee behind me, Satan. That's Peter. And we're very much like him. We all have our little ball of contradictions in our lives that by the Holy Spirit, those things have had to be worked out and continue to be worked out. And so Peter is the perfect example 
um, of how a transformed life in light of the cross, in light of the resurrection, can be used by God for his glory and for the good of his people. So let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 2. I'm not going to read the entire chapter. feels like I'm going to be reading most of it, but I'm actually not. There are certain pieces that I'm going to be focusing on. The title of today's message, now I had a whole other title, and I changed it about uh, an hour ago because it kept pressing on me. I was like, oh, I was like, I hope Eileen doesn't be mad, but I'm going to change this title. (laughs) When God shows up. Jesus gave the command, wait. Before you try to do anything for me, wait. Wait for the promise. Wait for the promise. They obeyed. In Acts chapter 2, I'm going to read the first four verses. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, now traditionally the day of Pentecost is 50 days after the Passover uh, on the Jewish calendar. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire, that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And that is the birth of the church. Did not come in quiet. And some people are confused. Some people are like, these folks are drunk. And people are, some people are trying to figure out what in the world is happening. It will be Our man, Peter, who is going to stand up in verse 14 and offer clarity. Let's go down to verse 14. He says, then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I have to say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Now, this is the Peter who hid. This is the Peter who, in a moment of weakness, denied that he even knew Jesus. That same Peter. He says, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Please understand that Peter is not just speaking to the 119 people he was with up in that upper room waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit. There are certainly people who are completely against them, who were completely opponents of Jesus during his earthly ministry. So Peter is not just preaching this message on the day of Pentecost among friends. He is also preaching among enemies. But what would enable him to be able to stand and deliver such a powerful message and a very pointed message? He pulled no punches. What could account for the change from 
missing in action and hiding and denying Christ to a bold proclaimer of the gospel. Let's keep going. Wait a minute, I need to put my glasses on first. Can you go back a little bit? Oh, actually, you know what? Leave it right there. Leave it right there. He said, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you, cru- whom you crucified. He could have just said, you know what? The Lord was crucified, but now he... No, no, no. He said, you, you are responsible. I'm sure that went over quite well for some of them. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what must we do? And I'm going to stop there for just a moment and then we'll read the rest in, in, in a little bit. There were a number of ways that I thought about this text. But at the end of the day, the star of the production is always God. Even though we are focusing on the life of Peter, we are really talking about the activity of the Holy Spirit doing exactly what Jesus promised he would do for the believer, and we are seeing it in Peter. The change that we see in the Peter we read about in the Gospels. The change can only be attributed to one thing and one thing only. And that is that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit. Now unfortunately, there have been some aberrant teachings some downright heretical and false teachings about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not, <clears throat> excuse me, is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. That's first and foremost. The Holy Spirit is not an essence or a feeling or a force that's very new agey and very wrong. The Holy Spirit is God. And Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us into all truth. That is a promise that still stands today. And what I love about Peter, the transformed life that we see, this transformed example that we see in Peter, starts with his obedience to Jesus. The Peter of old would have said, I know exactly what to do. We're going to go out. We're going to set up booths. We're going to pass out have pamphlets. We're going to give out lemonade. And this is how we're going to attract people to know that you were raised from the dead. That would have been the old Peter. The transformed Peter knows that he must wait on God. There is nothing more irritating than when you have a passion to do something and you feel like God is leading you to do it, but then we skip one important step, and that is to wait for God's direction. Peter did not get ahead of God. He did not get ahead of the Holy Spirit, and because he waited, the Holy Spirit was able to then show so that people would know this had to be God. This was not the work of these men. The sound came from heaven, so it was like, literally, it was like a violent wind. I like the older translation, a rushing mighty wind. That the people, you could not say that they manufactured this. It was something beyond outside of them. Why? So that God and God alone can get the glory. 
Because unfortunately, what can happen sometimes is that we can confuse our busyness with the Holy Spirit's activity. And they are nothing alike. Our activity will leave us broken and disappointed and wondering what happened. But when we do what Peter did by waiting on the Spirit and then moving accordingly, we get order. Not only do we get order, we get a clear presentation of who Jesus is and why his death and resurrection matter. And there is no confusion. When was the last time you got ahead of God on something? I know what it's like to be out of step with God (laughs) so many times. And I have had to learn the hard way what it was like to have to stop and go back to where I fell and say, Lord, I, I, I sinned, I messed up. I was not patient. I did not trust you enough to wait. The waiting comes before the power does. And we see that in this example on the day of Pentecost. What I love about this text, what I love about this story, when God shows up, things have to change. I don't know what these people were doing before that before the Holy Spirit came. But when he showed up with power, things changed. The fire fell. But not only do things change, guess what? People have to change. Think about where you were 10 years ago in your walk with Christ, for those of you who, are, who have been believers for a long time. Are you the same way you were 10 years ago? Thank you, Will. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Will. Prayerfully, you see how you are being changed from glory to glory and being daily conformed into the image of Christ, looking more and more like Jesus. That is one of the things, that's what the Holy Spirit does. He lives inside of us now. And he is changing us and making us more like the Son. Because people need to see a transformed life. And the people here are seeing and experiencing the transformation that the Holy Spirit has wrought in the heart of Peter. But what what matters even more is that Peter is so available to God, is so not caring what the crowd is thinking, that he is saying exactly what the Holy Spirit says, even when he knows people don't like it. We all have heard hard things. Sometimes we've had to have those, you know those private conversations that are difficult? Okay, imagine having one with thousands of people and you're the only one talking and you're the one saying the hard things. Some of the people in that crowd most likely were a part of Barabbas' crowd. Crucify him, crucify Jesus. They are not preaching in a vacuum. Peter is not preaching in a vacuum, excuse me. He is preaching among friends and enemies. But because of the Holy Spirit-driven boldness that is in him because of the promise of the Spirit, Peter is able to stand and deliver and give out what God gave him to give. How many of us have cowered and slinked away from conversations we know the Holy Spirit told us to have. He 
it's, it's tough. I am not a psychologist, and I can't give you three points in a poem, though I do teach literature at school. But the truth of God's word, when God gives you something to say to your family member or your friend or that boss who is trying to convince you to do something that you know is wrong, where is your boldness coming from then? Because if we will stand on what God has told us to do, our confidence comes in knowing that no matter what, he's going to back us up. Because he's going to back up the word he has placed in us to give in that moment. And we're seeing churches and denominations fold because we can't do that anymore. Jesus Christ is still Lord in 2024. I did not mean to rhyme, by the way. But he's still Lord. The Bible is still the word of God, the authoritative word of God. That has not changed because we have 162 genders, apparently. There's only two. And just to be clear, I'm not the person, I don't pick on this particular issue or that, that's not my heart. But we have gotten so way away from this and then we can't talk about it. These are the moments to be bold, not to cower. We are called to be conduits of grace and truth by boldly proclaiming the truth that the world needs. And the enemy has gotten in because some of us have mistaken kindness and cowardice. We can stand for the truth and still love people. We can speak the truth in love, and yes, some of them will probably be mad. But I guarantee there's always going to be that one who's going to come back and say, listen, I didn't, I didn't agree with what you said when you said it. Can we talk? Because God is all about relationships. That's why Peter is able to stand where he stands here. Jesus took the time with him on that beach to restore him in John chapter 21. It is out of that that assurance of knowing that Jesus has him, that Jesus loves him, and that Jesus has called him to shepherd the flock. Peter knows that his, he is secure in Christ, and it is from that position that you do and say what you must for God's glory, as he commands. And that is what Peter does. Verse 36, I'm sorry, verse 38, Peter replied when they said, brothers, what shall we do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and the promises for you, and your children, and for all who are afar off, for all whom the Lord, our, uh, the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them. He pleaded with them. So this was not him. The fire and brimstone nonsense, that gets on my nerves because mostly it's, it's some preacher who, had a, who ate something that did not agree with him or her, and now they just have a whole bad attitude. I'm like, sweetheart, sit down, because you don't love anybody. We know that Peter is pleading the heart of God because he knows what awaits those who reject the free gift of salvation. So he's pleading with them in love. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And the people stoned him. No. There were certainly people who walked away and said, nah, that's not for me. Fine. But... Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to, that, to the number that day. That's the first sermon. The advent of the Christian church 
3,000 believers baptized and one transformed man was raised up by God and under the power of the Holy Spirit said what needed to be said and God moved. That's what happens when God shows up. That's what happens when God shows up in a church. That's what happens when God shows up in your car, on your job. Shows up. I heard this testimony is wild. This guy, he is a, he's a, I don't know if he's still doing it now, but he was a gospel rapper. Yes, there are Christian rappers. But at the time, he was in a gang. And his mother was a believer, had been praying for years for her son. He's like in his early 20s, just in a lot of stuff. He was in the backseat of a car. They got caught up in a drive-by. The bullets start flying. He's in the backseat on the floor. And I cannot remember the song, the song that he said he learned as a child. But he just, he said he started praying it, and he could feel God's presence on that floor with him. And you know the prayer, God, if you get me out of this, dot, 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 dot. We've all prayed it, you little heathens. You know you have. I have too. (laughs) He said, if you get me out of this, I will follow you. Miraculously. The Holy Spirit protected him. And he went on to share that testimony with a lot of kids the churches, because when God shows up, things have to change. God <laughs> cut history, partitioned history with his son, the birth of his son. He changed history through the birth of his church, and now he is asking his believers in 2024 at New Life Community Church in Sayville to trust him, to be bold for Christ, not be rude, not to confuse being rude with being bold. Those are two completely separate things. But to be bold in the assurance that this is the word of God and that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation, that there is no other Savior, that there is no other way, and that he has given his life to make that possible. I told you a few, the last time I um, preached about one of my students who had a meltdown and we, we talk, we pray, and the next day she, she received Christ. Oh. But now she has roped three other people in, and they're like, we are doing Bible study. We're doing it on this day. I was at my desk trying to eat my lunch, and I hear this. So, yeah, we want to do Bible study now. Are you available? Yeah, come on, right now. I'm like, Sure. <laughs> I'm like, Lord, this plot twist, I was not expecting this. If you, you, I was not expecting this. But I am watching these students become bolder and bolder and bolder for Christ. What would it look like for you? And then I'll sit down. Looking at the example of Peter, if you didn't get ahead of the Holy Spirit, that if you fully surrendered your plans and your will to him and you said, do with me as you will, lead me, give me the words to say and the way I should say them to whoever I need to say them to, what impact would you have on the people around you, the people you're afraid that if I tell you the truth, you'll hate me. 
what impact would that have? The world needs what we have. The world, our culture, is swimming in deception and lies. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. His word is truth. And he has given us the spirit of truth to proclaim that. So let us stand boldly in his power and in his authority to do what he has called us to do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you, Lord God, for, for the, just the joy of knowing you and for the peace that comes from receiving you as our Savior. We thank you for the assurance, O oh Lord, that you give us daily in your word. Stir up in each of us, O oh God, a desire, a hunger, a deep hunger for your righteousness and your truth. That we would look more like you, Lord God, and that we wouldn't be afraid to look and be different. Arrange for each of us, O oh God, those conversations, those divine appointments with people who need you. They need your grace and they need your truth. Help us, O oh Lord, to be conduits of mercy and peace and joy that comes from the Spirit. Fill our hearts, O oh God, with a love for your people and for people who do not know you. May we be available to you, Lord God, and surrender everything else that gets in the way of that. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.